on to the board meetings. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, okay. Clearly, the fact that I'm sitting down means I declined to give a lecture. Um, but I am so happy to be here um, this week with all of you in this new configuration of this Divinity School with Andover Newton um, freshly here. Berkeley was freshly here when I arrived. Um, I'm looking around and seeing friends old and new, and we've all held up really well. So um, I want to thank you for engaging what I'd like to think of as a conversation. I did think a lot about what I wanted to say to you, and I wrote it in very tiny handwriting. So I will be um, looking down at some of this. Um, my National Enquirer headline, How Teaching Religion 101 Saved My Ministry, um, was really a way of honoring the mission of this school. Uh, from the time I arrived here in 1973, I learned that this is a place that was dedicated to educating people for ministry in and beyond congregations. And since I was an unchurched person at that point, had not yet found a denominational home. That freed me in a lot of ways to stand next to Presbyterians who were preparing for their ordination exams and knew exactly what they were going to do after seminary, and I had not a clue. Um, as I did a quick count in the last few days of my fellow residents in Bushnell House, first time I came for the advisory council meeting, I tried to find my old bedroom and realized it was like the, the stairwell. It was at the top of the stairwell, so I just stood for the vibes that were left. But I did a quick count of the, of the men and women who lived upstairs and downstairs in Bushnell House in those days, and I counted um, people who went on to become a physician, psychotherapist, Lutheran bishop, LGBT activist, author that tells you his age, he stopped at LGBT, um, <laughs> fundraiser for nonprofits, college chaplain, a co founder of an interfaith wisdom school in Nashville, Tennessee, and the senior pastor of the National Evangelical Church in Beirut, Habib Bader. Um, those are the people I went to school with. And it, it is perhaps telling that at least two of them were here on a Rockefeller trial year in seminary, which in some ways underscored the mission as I read it in those days, which was this may not have been in your career plan, but come check it out. You know, take a year at a seminary of your choice to think about what it might be um, to serve in ordained ministry, I think was the wish then, but the physician certainly went on to medical school and someone else went into forestry. And uh, I think the Rockefeller brothers finally decided to make it a little more um, narrow in terms of <laughs> the vocational things that might come out of that. But I, um, all but one of those housemates of mine were ordained, and several served congregations for a time, as did I. But um, it wasn't either or for them, I don't think, certainly not later in life. Um, they, like I, at midlife, uh, found that their roles and their souls were a little bit out of sync and that it was time to readjust. Um, that we learned here there were different forms of ministry both in the world and in the church and at different times of life. Um, on Monday evening here we honored um, a 1975 alum of the school who took his theological education into environmental law. Uh, one of my oldest friends here took hers into community social work. I sit here with people who have come through Yale and done a wide variety of things. Um, in light of the changing realities in churches and seminaries since I left here, it seems to me there's no better time to both bless and educate for all kinds of ministries, uh, bivocational, multicultural, interfaith, post-denominational, lay ordained. Um, I was even enamored of a, a Vedanta monk I met recently who said that a fake monk had moved into the Vedanta house to help him. And I, I, he had to explain to me what that was, but he ended up saying, you know, I don't think he really is, but he's very helpful. He's very helpful around here to me. And I thought, well, there's one more to add to my list, fake monks <laughs> that um, are, are nonetheless fulfilling a, a form of ministry that, that fell in front of them. Um, one of the hardest things about speaking to public gatherings right now is how often I get asked to predict the future 
of parish ministry or church or seminaries, and I could not be more clueless. I often tell people I wouldn't have written a book called Leaving Church if I could have figured out how to stay. But at that point, you know, my vision of how to move forward in that place at that time um, hit a wall. And I did later, many years later, write a book called Leaving Church. I left the out of it on purpose. It was not leaving the church, but it was remarkable how many letters of consolation I got from people who regretted to hear I was leaving the ministry or leaving the church. And one, one bishop whom I love so much wanted me to get into spiritual direction quickly before my relationship with God was completely gone. And I had to write him back and say, this is really hitting the wall in, in, in parish ministry. It really, God doesn't have tons to do with it. So, so he was relieved. But it was really interesting how the, the news that I had left parish ministry became the news that I had left ministry, had left the Episcopal Church, had renounced my orders. Um, and, and I will tell you the story in my way of how really my education here saved that for me, saved my sense that I still had a ministry, though there were a number of years when I lost a great deal that had been associated with that for me. So I don't have answers. You should ask the professionals. There are many of them here this week, uh, deans and board members, advisory council members, professors and students who are brilliant. Um, I do, however, have a narrative, and it's what I've been doing with the last 20 years of my life, along with teaching college, is, is writing books, the chief virtue of which is that I will sometimes say things out loud other people have the sense not to say, and then they come up afterwards and say things like, I thought I was the only one, or I'm so glad you said that out loud. So I'm kind of like the kid on the old Cheerios commercial, you know, what was his name? He'll try anything? Give, yeah, Mike, Mikey will try anything. So um, I've got a kind of Mikey vocation of, of go ahead, try it, write about it. And I'm certainly not alone in that. Um, the, 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 so I, I'd like to talk in first person narrative. And, and what that means above all is that it is, um, it is a first person narrative. I, I arrived at that after years of using the, the plural pronoun we, we believe, we are called to, we understand, we read scripture to mean. And uh, that, once I got in the classroom, got whittled pretty quickly down to I. There was not a lot I could say on behalf of the wide variety of students in front of me, but it turned out to be liberating because um, you can't argue with me a lot about my experience. That's my sacred thing. So I want to talk a little bit about what, what happened to me in, in a very culturally specific part of the country, the southeastern United States, where Christendom is not post yet. Um, but interestingly, not post yet, though um, the county one hour south of the college where I taught is one of the 300 uh, minority majority counties in Georgia, which means there are 89 different religions there, 110 languages spoken in the public schools. And Piedmont College, more and more uh, matriculated students who had graduated from those public colleges. So I think in a way, Clarksville, Georgia and Piedmont College, a small church related, now dually affiliated UCC and the good old NACCCs, if any of you remember them, the we are not UCCs. Um, but it's a dually affiliated college uh, with a Mayflower on top and with dorms named Ipswich, you know, in Demarest, Georgia. So, so it's, an, it's a rich and interesting um, part of the country. There is a, a Theravada, uh, Laotian Buddhist temple nine miles south of the college. Uh, beyond that, there are not enough Jews to form a minion. There are not enough Muslims to keep a halal butcher in business. Um, and the wide variety of religious diversity that I encountered was Christian. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, it's also a privileged narrative. I, after all, went to YDS. So uh, uh, it's my story, it's not your story, but I'll be really interested if I can manage my time to hear how it perhaps touches um, or sounds a little bit like yours. So uh, I'm sticking with my National Enquirer headline. How religion, Teaching Religion 101 Saved My Ministry. You might need to know that before I arrived at Piedmont College, Religion 101 was Introduction to the Bible. Um, and that was challenged and changed before I ever arrived. There was no religion major at Piedmont before I arrived. Um, there, there was a philosophy professor who taught in the Department of Humanities. And um, 
Religion 101 was changed to Religions of the World, and that was a decision by virtue of the then Faculty Senate before I got there, which I found such an interesting change. Um, not unopposed by any means, but it, it seemed to the faculty and the board at that time that teaching world religions in a small liberal arts college in the rural part of Northeast Georgia was the thing to do. So it shifted for me at the same time that I was running out of steam and had asked God for a vision that God did not provide for a small church that was growing beyond its 82 seats and did not find that comfortable. Um, a religion position opened up at Piedmont College, uh, a major was started, and for the next 20 years I served as the only, they would quarrel with full-time, but a only full-time religion professor at a church-related college. There was one philosophy professor, one religion professor, and one chaplain at a time when there were 20 English professors, more coaches than I can count, um, and in a way a miniature version of I think what this university went through of wondering whether there was any place left for a religion major um, at a church-related college. So interesting times, um, especially interesting times to teach world religions before 9-11 and after 9-11 and through wars in Kosovo, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, during different times of that school's life being a place where people who um, had come to this country as refugees ended up being funded to attend this small college, largely by congregational parishes um, who knew it you know, as a small place where students might um, not be thrown into the University of Georgia with as many students as my county has inhabitants. Um, the main thing that happened, and again, not willingly perhaps, is that um, Teaching Religion 101 began to save my ministry by getting me out of the house. Um, to be a parish minister in a small rural town, as many of you know, to try to get out of the house is like trying to break up with your cell phone. It's really hard to do because the screen's always busy. There's always a reason to answer one more email, return one more phone call, open the mail, file the parochial report. It was my job. It was what I did was to nurture faith in what in my county is a really bonsai tradition. The Episcopal Church was so unknown when I tried to find my way to the church for the first time, I had to stop and ask at a filling station because there were no Episcopal Church welcomes you signs. Apparently it didn't, you know, or you had to know your way to get there. And I remember still someone who said, oh, you're looking for the Espicable Church. And I thought, no. <laughs> so it was, a, it was an, again, an interesting little, t little tiny denomination. Um, but it did keep me in the house a lot, and I really had to go off screen to follow on moving day a little flatbed truck that the Piedmont Maintenance Department had sent to empty my little parish office at Grace Calvary. You know, the old desk, the chairs, the, the sofa, the many, many books and all the other things that I gathered in five and a half years there to follow a flatbed truck six miles to my new domicile and to be um, escorted to a little tiny office where the nameplate said not the Reverend, not MDiv, but Barbara Taylor Humanities. And that was a bit of a shock. Um, I didn't know whether, I didn't, it, it was a shock and in a way a wonderful reprieve all of a sudden to be welcomed to the Department of Humanities <laughs> and not any longer to be the person, you know, whose chief credential was Master of Divinity, which in fact was an inadequate degree to teach college. So I was soon a, a, a priest without a parish and a, and a professor without a PhD, which was good, a good liminal place to be. So I, I, I opened the door to that small place. Um, I realized it was time to downsize big time because I, there was no room for my stuff in there. Um, and then the building burned before I could even move in. So make of that what you will. Uh, but it was not the same at all to be all of a sudden part of a faculty. Piedmont was not a university, but I felt as if I had been placed in a universe of standards of truth, of ways of making meaning, of people whose expertise was, was cataloging new salamanders in the rich biodiversity of Northeast Georgia, um, a, a biological evolutionist who was also a deacon in his Baptist church and had a hard time reconciling those identities. I mean, 
the, the number of people I sat in faculty meetings with and listened to the ways they were training their students to make meaning of and difference in the world uh, was very different from what I had done in parish ministry. So it got me out of the house um, and had me finding my way around a new neighborhood that in some ways brought back Proverbs 8. I had to look it up for you. But, but the phrase about how wisdom in chapter 8 um, stands at the crossroads. She's out in the roadway. You know, she, she's calling from the heights. But I hadn't been at quite a crossroads like that. And again, very relative for you in, in urban centers or who've been in much more diverse positions than I am. But getting out of the house for me brought me into a crossroad of different disciplines, different ways of, of making meaning and measuring excellence that were new to me. Um, teaching Religion 101 saved my ministry by absolutely knocking me off my pins. Uh, my clothes didn't work. My pronouns didn't work. Uh, my Christian vocabulary, especially my Episcopal vocabulary, did not work. My biases did not work. You know, the, 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 I, was, I wouldn't say I was comfortable in parish ministry, but there was a we there that worked. If you wanted to pray the Book of Common Prayer, there was only one place to go in Habersham County. And it meant the Daughters of the American Revolution sat next to the League of Women Voters. And it meant that one of my dearest parish lay people was just uh, the youth recruiter for the National Rifle Association. And he wanted to come to my house and fit me out with a pistol and a safe room so that if worse came to worst, I would be safe. And that was out of pure love for me. So I came into much more diversity even in the Episcopal Church than I had in an urban place where you can drive past other churches to get to the one where you're most comfortable. But mercy, the first day I looked out at that classroom and it was not apparent then, but I was talking to Jehovah's Witnesses and Seventh-day Adventists and Holiness Pentecostal and, and CME and AME and, and, and Mormons and, and people who use such different Christian vocabularies from me. Only a spattering of international students, often when those, the, the students who had come in some kind of refugee situation came in, but I, um, I learned quickly that first of all, my Christian crowd was so small that most had never heard of it. Um, to find students who had come from traditional mainline traditions was like finding a classic car in the parking lot. Uh, the Presbyterian student whose dad was a pastor down in coastal Georgia came in already having read everything Marcus Borg wrote and having written a fan letter and gotten one back for him, but he was very unusual. I'll tell you what though, his faith was safer than people who had not gone to the mat with it the way that he had. And, and so there was a lot of learning from the mainline students who came in in many ways more secure on their feet because they'd heard some things and read some things that students from what you might call more protected or insular traditions had not. Um, one woman's husband forbade her to go on a field trip to St. Philip's Cathedral in Atlanta for Evensong, as I was trying to take students on field trips. Christianity gave me a lot of choices, but I thought a number of them might enjoy watching people in ruffs, you know, around their necks, looking very um, British, sing um, medieval things. Uh, and one woman's husband told her she could not go, that that was not of Christ. And that, and that was quite a shock to realize that I was not of Christ. <laughs> But so many kinds of Christians, so you can begin to hear a kind of humility that really knocked my pins out from underneath me. A lot of my favorite words were gone. I even pretty famously found myself switching a position I'd had in church that we needed to preserve the vocabulary of faith, even the Episcopal vocabulary. I'll meet you in the narthex or the sacristy after the vestry meeting, you know, the, the things that just went whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. Um, and, and I had sort of followed Will Willimon and Stanley Hauerwas on the need to preserve that language, but not if I wanted to talk to students from such a wide variety of traditions. In many ways, I, it was time for me to learn their languages. There was a phrase a long time ago about being a servant leader, and I learned how to be a student teacher in a different sense. To be a teacher, I had to be a student of the students to be their teacher. There was also this whole new world of assessment that um, was shocking to me. 
that all of a sudden I was part of an academic system that wanted me to link my course assignments to measurable objective learning outcomes um, that required annual self-evaluations from me, including my goals for last year and how well I'd done for them. They had to be measurable goals and to set new measurable goals for the following year, peer review, a dean's response to my self-evaluation. I had never been scrutinized. I mean, my complaint in the parish was it was hard to tell if I was doing a good job. In the college, it was almost impossible to escape the measures for whether I was doing a good job. Um, it, it, my dean was a Missouri Synod Lutheran who, who had his PhD in math. And that concerned me for a while about my ability to, you know, operate on several levels with him. But his son ended up in my class on New Testament, which ended up helping him a great deal. And he asked me to write his recommendation to a Missouri Synod Lutheran Seminary. So again, it knocked my pens out from underneath me. Um, that's another thing it did for me. Later you can say, and why are these things good? Um, it changed my role dramatically, and this is really the heart of, of what Teaching Religion 101 did to my sense of ministry. I come from a mother-father tradition, Christian tradition, um, where people are still called father so-and-so, and when I go to really the beating heart of the Episcopal Church in the South at Sewanee, and I'm walking across campus in a clerical collar, I have to prepare myself for someone to say, Mother, do you want a ride? And I have to look around for Mother, you know, to see where she is. But there's a sense in which I, I come from a mother-father tradition, which in many ways accentuated a lot of the parental language, both in the prayer book and in scripture. And it did mean that more times than I was comfortable, especially as a person who had not parented children of my own, that I was working out some very old stuff with people around authority and deity and fatherhood and motherhood of God. Um, and that changed radically when I went into a classroom. First of all, with a whole crowd I almost never saw in church, and that was college students because I was not you know, in a, a campus church. I was not in any kind of church with an active campus ministry. So all of a sudden I looked out at a classroom of 19 to 23 year olds. Um, confirmation class had come and gone for them. And they were on the whole, I would say, whatever course it was, they were there testing the teachings that people like me had given them when they were younger. They were there on their rumspringa you know, they were there on their walkabout to decide what was going into the rummage sale, as Phyllis Tickle famously said. You know, what had the people who loved them given them that they wanted to keep? And then, frankly, some of them would say, and what were they lied to about? What were they protected from? Um, and it turned out that it was impossible to avoid those topics in, in any kind of religion class. But the last thing they wanted was a parent the last thing, or an aunt, or an uncle, or a grandparent, or frankly, a pastor. They didn't want the loving monitors who had loved them enough to stuff their backpacks with good stuff before they left their home churches, who had laid hands on them and blessed them before they went off to college. And some had been warned to stay away from the religion curriculum, that that was the worst thing they could do, and that even if they meant to go on as pastors, they could get that later or get that at church, but they should not by any means you know, wander into the wilderness of a college religion class, which would make them lose their faith. It actually would, but I'll talk about that in a minute. <laughs> so I was their teacher, which turned out to be a whole new paradigm for me. Really, it is its own paradigm, and it's not parent. It's not parental. Um, it is perhaps priestly, but I wouldn't have said that. But to be teacher, um, not a church teacher, because I could give grades. And that leverage was alarmingly sobering. You know, to realize that I could set up for about 10 days a camaraderie with students who were so happy to be in a place where they could ask questions and trespass and read books that would not have had the imprimatur of their home places. Um, they were so happy to be there until the first quiz. And then they, their eyes would get slanty, you know, as the grades came back and they said, you're not my friend. You know, you are acting like my friend, but you, you're, you're going to grade me on this. 
and, and that introduced a new dilemma. Where do you put ability to tolerate existential ambiguity you know, on measurable learning outcomes or growth and spiritual maturity or an ability to ask better questions? You know, I mean, those kinds of things were impossible to grade on. So in some ways, the sojourn in the classroom was also a way of, of finding subversive ways to meet the academic requirements and not shortchange students on that, but to give them large ungraded assignments that they had only to complete to earn the points. And it was not going to be um, that. But it was different from being a church teacher because I kept attendance, I gave grades, and that went on their syllabus. I've decided that's like the classroom version of you're going to heaven or hell and I'm in charge, so you better come. <laughs> you know, the, the ways in which that doesn't get people to church in quite the same way anymore still gets students into the classroom, so. Um, I was not there to give them answers. I sort of switched from the answer business to the question business. Um, and again, to resist their fond wish that they'd come to a place where they could get answers, but instead to focus on asking better and better questions, which was not what some had been looking for. And I wasn't even there to buttress their Christian identity because there was a Bible school 20 miles away that did that. And students who chose that college got good educations, but it was different. They learned Christian apologetics in world religions class which was how to be, be in dialogue at best or to rebut, you know, at worst, um, different um, competing truth claims. So if they came to Piedmont, um, they came, most of them, with some kind of Christian identity, but it was no longer my job to buttress that. You know, the, the Christian formation was underway, but it was not my job. My job instead was to help them recognize, and this was so hard for some, that they had a worldview, you know, that they had a social location, that they had a cultural history and identity, that they had an idea about what constitutes normal, that people didn't all share. And the classroom had to become a safe place to encounter that huge, I don't know what word you'd put on it, huge invitation to relative truth that caused some to slide right off the Christian map, you know? I mean, for some, just the idea that it was a worldview and not the worldview was the most, the most upsetting thing that happened. Um, to study religion in a way that few of them had before, so that I had to spend a whole class session talking about the difference between devotional study of faith and academic study of religion and that they did not have to crash, but they were going to be different. And the way I tried to soften this was to talk about the difference between primary places of faith. And I said, we're gonna learn some upsetting things here. And you need to take some of your questions to your pastors and to your Bible study leaders and to your campus chaplains. Um, this is a secondary place, I said, and this is not a place for formation of faith, but it is a good place for testing of faith, for deepening of faith, perhaps for some of you. And in a minute, I'll tell you how for some it was where they woke up to faith. Big surprise to me. Um, but what it meant, and I hate to say this, and it's still a regret, is I was in the business of making misfits who might never fit comfortably in their home congregations again. You know, I still remember the young woman who was so fascinated, and she's one of these who just took fire. She was a Messianic Jew who so took to the New Testament and would bring her Jewish New Testament, you know, which substituted Mashiach for Messiah. And, but when she found out about the Septuagint, you know, and that Jews, including Paul, had quoted from the Septuagint, you know, in the New Testament. She had to go home and let her pastor have it. She just sort of baited him on what he could tell her about the Septuagint. I thought, this is why he told you not to take religion classes, you know, but, <laughs> but it, was, it was her way of going home and being in dialogue and being so thrilled by what she had learned, but finding she'd lost her conversation partners, you know, that, that, that it was not going particularly well. So I, I finally got some solace in the humanities meeting. And they say, oh, that's what we do. We make, we, we disorient, you know, we make people misfits. We, we equip people with things that are not going to help them fit easily from where they came. And we're not going to solve it all for them. But that seemed to me 
the opposite of what I'd been doing in church, you know, which was trying to strengthen identity and, and give people a place to stand and, and a vocabulary and a we, a we pronoun. So, um, so, but what I found was a secondary place was what many, many students welcomed, a chance to explore and trespass and confer and decide. And when I gave them opportunities to check, how did I put it? Ibu Patel taught me to say, how do you identify around religion. I think that's the way he says it. So you don't require people to be in one, but I give them the boxes and you guessed it, spiritual but not religious. Got quite, quite a few checks, enough for me to ask them what they meant by that. But it did match up with a Pew 2018 survey of the nuns, the N-O-N-E-S, um, about the main reasons why they remained unaffiliated. And as recently as this year, apparently 60% said they had questions about a lot of religious teachings they had received. Interestingly, not religious practices they had been taught. Is that not interesting? And maybe that's the same in their minds, but to me, they weren't questioning practices. Eucharist, baptism, foot washing were okay, but it was the teachings that were separating them from more people than it seemed to relate them to. They were deciding whether to recommit or not, and others had been expelled from their primary places, um, largely because of sexual identity. Um, people with very traditional faith, very interested in serving in traditional capacities in their home churches, in singing, in Bible study, in youth work, who found themselves uninvited to assume those positions of leadership and so who were really at sea about where they would land because they didn't want to give up the faith and they sure weren't going to give up Jesus but they had lost a community that um, blessed that, that blessed their participation in that. So I found a large sacred part of my new job was to be a companion in that, not officially but in their papers, in office hours, um, not as their chaplain, because there was a chaplain at the college, and I freely referred people, but as their teacher. It was a different thing to be their chaplain in their thinking, to be their chaplain in their asking of questions, to be a chaplain to their skepticism, and a, and a chaplain to their believingness. So that when I came to one of the hardest things for any of them, and I haven't gotten to world religions yet, here goes conversation, was the canonization process of the New Testament. May not sound like much to you, but when a student finds out that a ceiling tile did not open and the New Testament dropped out, <laughs> and that it is what the early Christians read you know, at church on Sunday, it's quite a shock to discover it took 400 years for that to solidify. And, and as you watch scales fall from people's eyes and various you know, measures of distress, I used to offer alternative ways of telling the story. I said, now if you have a high view of the Holy Spirit, you know, the Holy Spirit was all over this, right? From the beginning, making cream out of some of those early documents and letting others fall to the bottom, you know, inspiring the Emperor Constantine to embrace a tradition, of, I mean, I said, I gave them a whole way to tell the story. And then the skeptics, I said, and you're, and you're also right, it was entirely political intrigue. And <laughs> it's, it's where empire took over church. And, and then perhaps not nicely said, decide how you're gonna tell the story. Cause the facts, you know, are not enough to support one of these definitively. So you're gonna have to choose. Not only how do you understand and tell that story, but how are you going to understand a lot of other stories about the Christianization of the world, about the Great Commission, about John 14, 6. You know, there's some things to talk about. Um, so my business was to disorient. And I never knew what they were working out. Um, not until later did I find out one of just the beloved students who went on not in religion, though so many people minored in it. It got to be a great minor. But she ended up, after a, a classroom discussion on different theological positions on adult and infant baptism, she, she sort of focused on she never had been baptized. And unbeknownst to me, because of Religion 101, sought out a pastor, arranged a baptism in a river, and, and took a place in a church that would come sing and help dry her off. And they hadn't been to the river in a while, so Carson also showed them that. Another student, I didn't know she's working on her conversion to Judaism, you know, but when it came time for her class project, she asked permission to set up a Shabbat service and, and bring candles and challah and let us hear how she was learning to sing the blessing prayers. 
Um, I did not know that one student's pastor in her community church, this is being taped, but it's all on podcast anyhow. He was presenting a three-week series on the Quran, at which he had read cold, not knowing Arabic, not knowing a single Muslim, but he had read the Quran, I believe out of genuine benevolence. He wanted his congregation to know what it really said. Unfortunately, his view of what it really said was this is a tradition in which it's all about a God droning on and on about how if you do not follow the Muslim path, you will go straight to hell. And meanwhile, we're studying the formation of the Quran in New Testament, and she came, not in New Testament, world's religions, and she came in one day and said, with her paper in hand, she said, it's so interesting to listen to him on Sunday and you on Tuesday. <laughs> and I just thought, what a phenomenal thing, you know, that that happened to be what we were studying. And again, very confusing for her, but I do believe she came out of it thinking neither of us were people of ill will, but that she was going to have to decide, you know, how she was going to tell that story. So little did I know. Um, surprisingly, very surprisingly to me, um, quite a few were working out their call to graduate study in religion. They came awake in the classroom in ways they had not come awake in their home churches. Academic study gave them such academic freedom. I didn't mention that earlier. They had a kind of academic freedom that had been unknown to them. Um, I wrote more letters of recommendation to seminaries from the classroom than I ever did from the little church I served. Um, three to here, including one for an Orthodox Jew who left after his first year because he said, it's so Christian. I said, Tim, <laughs> what did you expect? But he was drawn here because of the mission statement, that this was a place, you know, that would take his tradition. He now teaches history very happily. Um, uh, one to Princeton, two to Emory, two to Mercer, Mercer's McAfee School of Theology, one to General Seminary in New York, one to Southern Baptist Seminary. We sent her to Wake Forest, but I think she went to the other one, um, which was Southern Baptist. Uh, one to the Missouri Synod Seminary uh, from little Piedmont College in Demarest, Georgia. Never occurred to me. Never occurred to me I would write three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, eleven letters of reference to seminary. Uh, granted, one or two came in with that in mind, uh, but the places they applied to switched. Patrick, are you here? One is here. I'm kind of glad he's not, because I'm telling Lake Wobegon stories here. Uh, but Patrick uh, Reed is here right now, and his beloved Emily Reed is why I'm here. Four, teaching religion 101 saved my ministry, um, because it was world religions, and it made me responsible, me responsible, for other people's religious treasures, <laughs> to communicate those largely to Christians um, in a way that woke the golden rule up for me like never before, to do unto these other traditions as I would have them do unto me, and to imagine a, a Muslim, a Hindu, a Buddhist, who had exactly four class sessions to present the treasures of Christianity, and to do my level best to do unto them as I would have them do unto me. Um, there's way more in that to talk about. Um, it also meant that it uh, made me responsible for getting out of the house in a whole different way. To teach world religions in a classroom is to like teach cooking by eating menus. You know, you just couldn't do it with paper. You had to get out of the classroom. So I had to go relearn the city of Atlanta where every major religion we were teaching had multiple, multiple variety of expressions. In an hour and 15 minutes, we could be at the Tibetan Buddhist monastery that's the seat of the Dalai Lama when he comes into town, or the $10 million um, uh, Al Farouk Masjid that serves Muslims from 30 nations in Atlanta. It's been there for 30 years. Um, I had to relearn the city of Atlanta where I only knew Peachtree Street, you know, with, with <laughs> Honest to goodness, the, some of the finest examples of mainline Protestantism and Catholicism in the South, and yet you had to look between and beyond them to find the much later funded, the synagogues were well funded early in Atlanta, but not the masjids and not the Hindu temples and Buddhist temples. Um, so again, I had to uh, become a student teacher as I tried to find places that were open to student visits, showing up in all our clumsiness, I'm trying to be perfect strangers at Friday Juma prayers or at a meditation session. Um, 
and at the same time to help students take the batteries out of the burglar alarms of faith because some of them absolutely freaked out in the van on the way to these places because they were so used to being evangelized, they were sure they would be evangelized the minute they stepped foot. You know, so I still remember the one student ahead of me at the, at the Tibetan center who was listening to a talk on cultivating happiness. And about three minutes in, he turned around and with big mouth said, this is just about life. And he was so relieved to realize he was welcome there to somebody who was saying, here, you can borrow the cup, but you don't have to buy it. You know, you can um, take this cup. Your cup's wonderful. You know, go home with your other cup. So um, I had to resist the taste like chicken phenomenon where I wanted to teach everything in another tradition by saying how it tasted like chicken and to finally realize alligator tasted like alligator and buffalo tasted like buffalo. And um, it made me a student. Um, fifth by getting me out of the house and knocking me off my pins and changing my role drastically and making me responsible for other people's religious treasures, including their Christian other traditions, um, I ha I, it made me question everything. It made me question everything I taught. Guess who had to think about her worldview, her cultural history and identity, her social location, her privilege, her normativity. You know, couldn't teach all that without going home and staying up half the night doing my own homework. And the more I learned about other major world traditions, to come home questioning my own teachings on original sin, salvation by faith alone, atonement, um, why the Great Commission became more beloved to so many people than the Great Commandment, why people who knew John 14, 6 did not also know John 12, um, 42, he who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. Why do we privilege the texts we do? Um, to, to, to look at the effects of clumsy evangelism and Christian normativity, how it led Muslim students in class to say, please don't out me as Muslim, I'm not ready to be seen that way. To, to, to see my tradition from the outside, to, to not, by virtue of being in a congregational college, wear a clerical collar much anymore. So I learned how people talked when they didn't know there was a clergy person in the room. There was a huge drop in cabin pressure to find out my planet um, was part of a universe of faith. And I needed better answers for students who wanted a rationale for why they should be in a class like World Religions. Why should they sit in a class where a Christian was going to tell them about the wisdom in other traditions. Um, and I decided I needed to do what Jonathan Sachs had called me to do years earlier in his book, The Dignity of Difference, and that was to work in my own Abrahamic tradition, to search my own scriptures and traditions to formulate a theology of difference. You know, it, to, to look at my own Bible stories, my own teachings and practices in order to formulate a way of speaking of how the unity of the Creator is expressed in the diversity of creation. And, um, and to offer that to students who perhaps had never heard Jesus' first sermon in Nazareth as a sermon about disowning God. God came not to the lepers or the hungry widows in Israel, but went to the widow of Zarephath and went to Naaman the Syrian, you know, who may never have heard the story of the Good Samaritan as someone who was the exemplar and went away to continue becoming a Samaritan who did it the wrong way. You know, I mean, the ways in which Christian tradition had its own tradition of righteous Gentiles, of people who visited us, blessed us, challenged us, and left us but did not become one of us, and that that might have been God's will. So that issued in a book called Holy Envy that will come out next March. Um, bottom line is I believe that teaching world religions uh, saved my ministry by unmooring it. Um, I felt most like Brendan the Navigator, the 6th century Irish saint who got in a little boat, according to legend, with 14 monks and three unbelievers to go search for the island of paradise, of the blessed. Um, teaching Religion 101 um, in an unintentional way set my boat afloat, and it took me far beyond my competence, deeper into the cloud of unknowing than I'd ever been. It gave me new reasons to search my own scripture and tradition, new ways to exercise my priesthood, largely official, with a far more lay <laughs> vocabulary, with more humility than I had ever uh, 
had to experience before, which, which many of my Christian peers saw as infidelity on the one hand and gullibility on the other hand. Um, but I, I took a lesson from Richard Rohr who said, I have prayed for years for one good humiliation a day. <laughs> I didn't even have to pray. <laughs> and then he said, I must watch my reaction to it. I have no other way of spotting both my denied shadow self and my idealized persona. I thought that was interesting. So I got a lot of built-in um, humiliations, which I read as humility makers. Um, Post-retirement now, I retired a year ago May. I don't know if you know that. Yeah, I, I thought it was something that would happen, like you retire and life would become calm. <laughs> and it turns out you have to make yourself be retired. But I'll tell you an interesting thing that has happened because I think I have a reputation for being unmoored and for being perhaps gullible and I don't know what. Um, I have found myself invited to the most interesting places. I have found new crowds of Christians I never knew existed. I found a crowd, you probably know, call themselves post-evangelicals. 4,000 of them gathered at the Wild Goose Festival last July. I was there meeting pastors of Pentecostal churches in Nashville who just come out for marriage equality and lost half their congregations overnight. He came to visit in Clarksville, taught me a heap um, in a week. I, I've met more and more of the spiritual but not religious. Got invited to something called Walk Fest, a global healing initiative in Idaho Springs, Colorado, where I was on the ticket with yoga teachers and people who work with compassionate capitalism and, and make malas out of crystals. I was out of my league. They'd never heard of me. I had never heard of them, and we all wanted to heal the world. Um, I work a lot with church alums, um, people who have left their churches or who still have an absolutely foot in it, but who are looking for secondary places. Who knew? And who show up at weekend conferences here and there. Their names would delight you if you don't know them. Awakening Soul, Gladdening Light, Wisdom Ways, January Adventure, Mountaintop Lectures. I've gotten on this speaking circuit that's largely people my age. My color hair is dominant. Um, but, but who have served, been formed, and are now at retirement age doing what good forest dwellers do. And that is reforming and rethinking faith. Um, before they go on to whatever comes after one leaves this incarnation. So it, that is sacred work too. But they too, people my age in my position, are looking for secondary places um, that do not cause them, again, many of them are the, the, the mainstays of their churches, though they will say they don't go as often as they used to because they're off at gladdening light and awakening soul. And, <laughs> Um, but they want places also where they can explore and trespass and confer and reform. Um, and I know the territory. So it's not a career path. Man, this is not a career path. I don't recommend it. But it began for me here. It began at Yale Divinity School, where I learned that there are many ways to serve, many ways to serve, both in and beyond congregations, that I did, did not leave ministry when I left parish ministry, and that there is unity in diversity not only in ways that people are human and ways that people are religious, but also in ways that people are in partnership in rapidly changing times. Um, I'm grateful for my kinship with every one of you, for everything that you are doing um, in this world and all the ways that you have given feet and hearts and hands to the mission of this school. And I'm above all, I'm grateful to you for inviting me and for being here to keep, keep all of this so alive and beautiful. Thank you for having me. You want to talk a little bit? I would love to. Um, talk a little bit and we've got about 10 minutes so uh, I, and I'd love to hear from you I'm happy to hear a question but I'm also happy to hear a challenge or a testimonial or 
Yes, hi. Is, is integral, but um, I have uh, the privilege of having taught um, part-time in a Catholic-related liberal arts school in the West Coast some, some years ago. My question is uh, not forming Christian identity in the role that you had, but wasn't there some formation going on? And oh, yeah. I'm a big believer in the liberal arts mission about formation. Um, and if a professor in religious studies is, is not intentional, they're probably forming them anyway, either to be skeptics or academics like oh, them, yeah, or, yeah, yeah. or maybe take a spiritual journey of some form. In that Catholic setting, I used to uh, have one assignment in an ethics class or a religion class that um, encouraged them, didn't require, but really encouraged them to take on material from a faith or ethical perspective. Um, I had one paper from a Satanist perspective, it was California, uh, and others from you know other kinds of perspectives, but I really wanted them to engage it as a participatory knower from their own mm -hmm. uh, perspective, even if it was mm -hmm. temporary. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious if that uh, has a place in, in liberal arts education for you, inviting them to actually to uh, be, be claim a place of formation for themselves, sometimes if they're well-defined, coming into it that way, but if not, taking it on as a possibility. I was, uh, yes, yes, and I'm, you know, the course that jumped to mind right away, World Religions does that again, because people are, one of the big five religions is Christianity. And students, you know, often will come up and say, I just found out I knew less about, I did worse in my own than I did in any of the others. But, but to, to require them both in field trips and then in a class called Religious Movements in North America, they really took on some of, you know, every religion born in America showed up in that class from, from the Native American church to Satanism, which turned out not to be what we thought, but, but to engage those dialogically. And, but the, the way you said it, I like it, is to claim their own place of formation. I could give them models for that, and they were getting it from other, other places. And, and frankly, some of their history professors and English professors were actually doing more to keep calling them toward Christian, you know, formation or religious formation than I was. So that was interesting. So yes, and I'm encouraged now to see more and more seminaries at the graduate level. I think Sewanee has a required course in world religions. Um, more and more have them on the, the ballot, but I'm watching ways in which you can't prepare for Christian ministry without a medium level of religious literacy, or your youth group members will know more than you do uh, about the world of faith. So th that's been encouraging. But the main thing that came to mind is how grateful I've been for an education in vocation. In other words, people who come into classroom with a, with a sense of readiness to learn, but vocation will translate across every major at Piedmont College. And, and it is a, it's religiously couched, but Lilly and other groups are working really hard and brilliantly, I think, at saying, no, there can be a call a Christian call, a Muslim call, a Jewish call, a religious call, a faith call to vocation in a wide variety of professions. Uh, and again, I think this school brings the theological education to bear on a wide variety. I'm watching seminaries redesign certificate programs and degree programs to equip people who are going into law and medicine and forestry to mention, you know, to, into other things but are bringing those values to bear. So you ask a, a great question. Yes, formation was occurring. And, and all I had to do was sort of learn what I could put my hands on and what I should not put my hands on, um, and how I could work in concert with the whole educational planet there. Thank you. Yes. Oh, yeah, I don't answer short. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you for this. Thank you for everything. Mm -hmm. Everything. Um, how did you explain interpret, um, talk about your particularity, your answer to the question, what is your, uh, what is Ibu, how does Ibu say it, uh, your relationship to around religion? Uh, how, how did you explain or interpret who you are to your students? That's a good question because for a while the idea was you, you were a blank slate, you didn't tell your students anything. They weren't supposed to know anything, but, but they, you know, they would Google me, you know, so there was no, I mean, now you can Google anybody, right? 
You can also rate your professors with chili peppers, which is really hard. Can you rate your pastors with chili peppers on, <laughs> online? That was, uh, but, but, I, but I, I reversed that. I said, you, write, you need to know right up front who's teaching you this stuff, you know? So, so let me tell you briefly. And then, but I would say, I consider this my Christian ministry now. I would say that to them, you know, that, that I, the part of my call I took up was the bridge building, peacemaking peace. And that the way I read my tradition, my job in, you know, right now was to um, take the battery out of their fire alarms, you know, about other world traditions. And especially to kind of hold up this idea of holy envy, that they didn't have to leave their traditions. If they had them, they didn't have to convert. If they identified as humanist, Satanist, however, I didn't have that. I had a lot of Wiccans and Goths and other things at times. But, but, that the, but holy envy gave them a way to envy to admire some things they were seeing in other traditions without having to switch, you know, or without having to feel unfaithful um, to their own traditions. So, so I tried to introduce that. That's Krister Stendhal's phrase, and I even put it on the final exam. What has inspired holy envy in you this semester? And that was an ungraded answer. And they, they were just terrific answers. But I identified up front what I did for a living, but that, but that I saw the classroom as the place that I was um, doing my best with the great commandment, you know, doing my best and, and trying to learn what my neighbor held sacred because I didn't know any other way I could love my neighbor but to do that. So, you know, and so professors can't help. We're going to model stuff. We're going to choose books we like. They're, they're, they're helpless to defend themselves against our ideologies regardless. But I um, just told them up front. And fortunately, my early peripatetic religious seeking, because I wasn't raised in a religious household, I was pretty equipped. You know, I'd been a Baptist and Episcopalian and Presbyterian. I mean, I, you know, when they told me how many churches they'd been through, I, I had some sense of what it was like to look, to keep looking, to keep looking. And as a student I love said to me last night, to keep looking not only for the place you, you want to welcome into your life, but the place that welcomes you into its life and that that's not always easy to find. So thanks. It's great to be with you. I look forward to continuing. I'm going to stick around for a little while if any of you have more one-on-one um, -on -one things you'd like to say to me. But I hope you, this is a wonderful schedule coming up. Thank you. Barbara, we want to say thank you for your authenticity, your honesty, and your perseverance in your quest, your own search for who you are and how you've represented the values that we hold sacred here. Thank you.